Hi, I'm Dave King with the Kestrel Land Trust, and we're doing our annual Hawk Watch, although this year we're doing it virtually. So we're here at the Skinner State Park uh, waiting for hawks to migrate by. So at this time of year, it's mid-September, the 17th of September, uh, a lot of birds are migrating now. Most of the birds, of course, in our area, including hawks, are actually migrants. They only visit us during the summer, then they migrate back to their tropical wintering. This is a great place to watch hawks for a couple of reasons. First of all, we have this wonderful ridge here, uh, um, and that causes updraft. So when you get a north wind, you get a nice updraft, and hawks can migrate on that effortlessly southward as they follow the ridge southward. So this area concentrates hawks. It's easy to watch them if the weather is right. Also, we have the flat valley out here, and the valley, uh, when the sun hits it on a nice day like today, creates these thermals, columns of rising air, and the hawks use those to gain elevation. When they gain as much elevation, the thermal starts to peter out. They start gliding off south until they find another thermal, and they ride that one up and they continue on down. Typically, they make a few hundred miles a day when the weather's great. Right. So that's the first step in hawk watching, is to find the right area. Like I said, some place that's either got a ridge that causes an updraft, or an area, an open area that has the thermals, good thermals. If you're looking for a place to hawk watch, Skinner's a great place. There's also a lot of other places around. You can find on the web, hawkcount.org has a lot of great resources for uh, locating a hawk watch near you. So the next thing you want to do when you're hawk watching is choose the day. And so typically around the 11th or so of September onward is when you start getting big movements of broadwing hawks, and that's really dramatic. Broadwing hawks, talk a little bit more about individual hawk species later, are a species that migrates in big numbers, oftentimes around the second week or third week of September. Ideally, what you're waiting for is you're waiting for a light following wind from the north or northwest. And so, uh, especially if there's been a period of bad weather where you have either south winds or rain, hawks don't really migrate with the south wind because they have to fight against the wind and they don't migrate during the rain. Uh, very much because, of course, they get wet. It's not favorable gliding conditions. So you really want a northwest wind. Today we've got a southeast wind, so things are a little slow. But uh, still, we're hoping that some thermals will um, eventually develop over the valley, and at that point we'll concentrate hawks to where we can see them. Uh, so um, when you're hawk watching, uh, typically uh, people use binoculars. Uh, I've got a pair of 8 by 30s they've got a nice wide uh, field of view, um, and they've got decent optics. I went in for a little extra money, so they got decent optics so you can get color uh, when hawks are lit from the hind, for instance. And often what you do is you scan the horizon. Well, first of all, you look around periodically because hawks could be migrating over or past you. But then, if you don't see any there, you scan the horizon kind of slowly and just looking for individual hawks or groups of hawks. A lot of times you'll see an individual hawk and it will be part of a it will either be part of a larger group or it will join a larger group. And so these groups that concentrate on thermals or updrafts, we call them kettles. They sort of form a whirling um, column of hawks as they follow the up uh, the, the lift of the air and then they peel off the top. And so a lot of times when you see a single hawk you keep your eye on it, they'll be joined by others and they'll form a kettle. And so that's something that's really dramatic and pleasant to walk, uh, uh, watch for. Um, and so you continue sort of scanning the horizon like that. And um, sometimes you can use a spotting scope. A lot of times, a spotting scope's got a narrow field of view, so it's harder to cover a big area. But a lot of times, if you see birds really distant, spotting scope helps to. Uh, because it's got greater mag magnification to zoom in, so you can really sort of ide identify it. So once you see a hawk, you want to identify it. And so um, it's uh, good if you have a good bird book. You definitely want one of those. And um, it's good, useful to divide the hawks up into the different families, because the families generally appear similar, and that gives you a automatic way of sort of separating them into smaller groups. For instance, one family is the Beautyonidae, and uh, they're soaring hawks. And all of them, because of the way they fly, they 
store on uh, thermals or the updrafts. And uh, they have very broad wings because they're adapted to soaring. And so what you want is really high wing loading if you're a soaring hawk. You really want a lot of wing surface area for your weight. And so they have big wings, long wings, and relatively short tails. Um, and so the red-tailed hawk is an example of a beautio that you might be familiar with. You see them around neighborhoods, sometimes along the highway, because they forage along the grassy areas along the side of the highway. Um, and so they're kind of a common one, brown on the back. They have a dark cummerbund here. And then, of course, the adults have a red tail. Juveniles don't, though, so you have to be careful about that. Juveniles are just sort of a, a gray tail. What we're really interested in this early part of the migration season is the broadwing hawk, because they're ones that migrate in huge numbers. Broadwing hawks, again, have wide, sort of long, wide wings, relatively short tails. Tails are banded. Uh, so if you have decent pair of binoculars, or if the birds are close, you can see that. Those are two com common kinds of beautios that we've really been seeing here at the Hawk Watch. So the beautios of the soaring hawks, there's another group that are sort of forest hawks. These are the exhibitors. And so they have rounded wings. Beautios also have rounded wings, but beautio wings are long and big. Exhibitor wings are relatively short, and their tails are long. That's sort of because the way they forage. Beautios soar around, they get to a perch, and they soar down and grab their prey. Sometimes they chase, but oftentimes they just land on a branch in the woods or in a field, wait for a rabbit to move, and then fly in on it silently and grab it. Exhibitors, they pursue birds. Like uh, a lot of times they'll hunt on bird feeders. They come zipping around the neighborhood, come up over a hedge, the birds scatter from a uh, feeder or some other area where they're concentrated, and the hawks are able to zoom into one. Because they have short wings and a long tail, they're able to maneuver really tightly. So exhibitors, unlike this, sometimes they soar, but they flap more than uh, beautios. So a lot of times you'll see them soar a little bit, flap, 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 soar a little bit. There's a couple of principal kinds of exhibitors that we see here at the Hawk Watch. First one's the Cooper Hawk. Cooper's Hawk is a little larger than the sharp shinned. Uh, it's a fair amount smaller than the red tail. But uh, when you see them flying overhead, the head really projects in front of the wing line, front line of the wings. Whereas uh, the other kind, the sharp shinned hawk, its uh, wings are sort of cocked forward so that the line of the wrists on the wings is sort of even with the bill, sort of. Also, sharp shinned hawks have a square tail, a sharp tail, you can think of it that way, whereas Cooper's, tail, Cooper's hawk tails are slightly rounded. So those are the exhibitors. And then a third group that you'll see up here at the Hawk Watch is the falcons. And so there's three principal kinds of falcons that we see here at the Hawk Watch. The other day, the day before yesterday, we saw a lot of kestrels. And so the kestrels, uh, hawk, falcons in general, have pointed wings. And these are for pursuit, because um, direct pursuit, because uh, broad wingtips slow you down. That's a good thing if you're foraging in the woods, because you want maneuverability, but not uncontrollable speed. Falcons, they typically forage in the open area, and those long pointed wings, they spill turbulence really fast. Think of a jet plane, they have pointed wings. And so um, falcons, uh, they uh, have those pointed wings and also long tail, and those are distinguish them from exhibitors or from beauties. Falcons also, because they, they're not really set up for soaring, they tend to flap quite a bit. The kestrel, when you see them fly over, they tend to have a very buoyant flight, around a little bit, and then when they turn, you can see that the females have a reddish brown back. Males have a reddish brown back, but bluish kind of slate wings. And they also have a cheek mark. And so kestrels are sort of distinctive, typically, because of that reason. The peregrine falcons are large falcons, and they have a more steady flight. They often fly more in a direct plane, steady, sort of shallow, strong wing beats and uh, there's slaty gray on the back. And then in between the kestrel, they're a fair amount larger, a lot larger than the kestrel. And between those two, there's the merlin. And the merlin also has a direct flight, but it's smaller than a, a peregrine and bigger than a kestrel. Again, if you find a good bird book, it'll have both pictures, but also descriptions. But those are the three principal kinds that you see here at the Hawk Watch. Are you taking another Sharpie? Or? Not sure yet.
So one great thing about being at the Hawk Watch is there are typically other Hawk Watchers around and they'll help you spot birds. And if you're not familiar with identification, a lot of times they'll help with or they'll help you with identification, point out birds. And so just someone just pointed out a bird that started from way over by Sugarloaf and came coasting through and it was very distant. With the scope, we were finally able to tell when it soared, when it turned, that it was actually an immature bald eagle. There was actually a second eagle there. So we were pointing it out a different land. Uh, with different um, landmarks on the horizon. Uh, so that's another great thing about hawk watching, is just hanging out with other hawk watchers. And in the end, you don't really need to worry about the identification. It's not like you're doing it for work, you're doing it for fun, and so have fun. A terrific thing about this time of year is the, the birds are migrating south, and a lot of these birds, most of them really, are ones that were born here in the forest, either right around uh, our region or further north. And so a lot of that, um, a lot of those birds uh, depend on conserved areas and particularly in the future as development and other, other threats to natural ecosystems continue. So conserved areas are really important for supporting these birds. Uh, and so um, a lot of hawks and particularly other predators and so predators generally require more, um, uh, more area uh, per uh, pair, for instance, than the animals that they prey on. So hawks in particular, they tend to use large areas during the breeding season. And so they need uh, some of them, like a uh, broad-winged hawk would be an example, need pretty big forested areas in order to breed. So uh, it's really great that the Kestrel Land Trust uh, has as part of their mission to provide these large contiguous areas uh, as breeding habitat for these birds. It's true. Zipiter, right? Uh, would you say that's uh, Cooper's or Cooper? Kind of looks like a pointed tail. So anyhow, um, it's true that these birds spend a lot of time in the winning, winning grounds. A lot of them spend mo most of the year in the winning grounds. And so there's a lot of challenges down there that we can't directly influence uh, through land acquisition up here. But we have shown through some research that we've done here at UMass that birds that leave in better condition, young birds that leave in better condition, actually survive better and uh, actually it contributes to the success of the following season. If they leave here uh, and they've grown bigger and they leave with more energy reserves, uh, they're more likely to acquire a good territory on the wintering grounds and more likely to return successfully. So in that way, we actually can contribute to the full life life cycle conservation of these species. So we were scanning along the horizon. It's a little hazy today, but we were scanning along the horizon and we spotted uh, a hawk and uh, it's moving really slowly around, sort of rising a little bit and it's not flapping. Broad wings, so we're thinking it's a beautio. It's also possible it could be an eagle because we've seen a number of those and eagles have big uh, bald eagles, so the ones we mostly see around here. They have really broad wings and tend to do that slow circling flight too. It's really distant. It's hard to even get any details off it, but uh, that's kind of fun. We'll speculate for a while what it is. Seems like I'm picking up some red on the tail, but it's so far it's hard to really tell, which would make it a red tail, obviously. Um, so um, we're not 100% sure if it's a migrant yet, and since we're watching migrant hawks, we're sort of trying to separate the migrants from the residents. Obviously, red, red tails breed here. Uh, so we'll see. We'll keep an eye on it and see if it moves. And uh, maybe as it comes closer, we'll get a better look. Looks like we got something that might be a broad wing. It's uh, circling, getting a lot of lift, which suggests that it is actually a migrant. Um, I pointed it out it's just above the UMass Library, so landmark I used. And so we'll find out uh, as it gets closer whether or not it's a broad winged hawk. But it has the right shape and movement. And after staring at enough birds, I sort of think I have a feel for it. I could be wrong, obviously, and uh, of course one of the amusing things about hawk watching is making the outrageous calls and then finding out that you're wrong, but it's all part of the game. Right, yeah, so I think that is a turkey vulture. Uh, it wasn't apparent at first, but I'm looking at it now and I can actually see through the scope it's red head. They also have a tilting flight. 
wings are often in a V or a dihedral. Yep, so turkey vultures, they're a migrant. They breed around here, but I think all leave eventually in the winter, most of them. Great resource uh, for hawk watching in general is hawk, uh, hawkcount.org. It's run by an organization that um, coordinates hawk watches all across the continent. When you go to that site, you'll see um, that they have uh, daily summaries for all the hawk watches reporting for a day, and then for a few days back, you can choose for a given hawk watch, you can look at last year's summaries, and uh, it has, it, it really is interesting because it helps you pick a place, it helps you gauge what day there's likely to be big movements of an individual species. And after you go to uh, Castro Land Trust uh, and donate there, go to Hawk Count, slip them a few bucks to keep their service going.